Hello and welcome back to the third in our series of game development tutorials for beginners. Here at Sumo we're mostly still working from home, so it's really good to be able to share our passion for game development with you. As before, you'll need a copy of GameMaker Studio 2 to make this game, as we make a more advanced game based on the character Agent 8. This time the gameplay is more down to earth and requires a precise control of collision detection and animation in order to make it work. Agent 8 finds himself trapped in what is essentially a pit, while forces unknown try to squash him with a series of boxes. However, careful positioning by Agent 8 will force his enemy to inadvertently create an escape route for him. We're going to call this game Spy Dare, as winning is all about putting yourself in danger. To make things more interesting, we're going to have three different types of boxes, which will crush each other depending on what they're made of. To make this easier to program, we're going to use a parent object. Any object in GameMaker can set another object to be its parent. Here we're going to use a generic box object to be the parent of all the different boxes in the game. Objects inherit all the events and actions of their parent. So if we add a create and a step event to obj box, then it's automatically applied to the other boxes as well. These inherited events will show up as greyed out events in those child objects. If we want just one of these objects to have its own unique step event, then creating one in that object will override the inherited one from its parent. Use of parenting in this way allows us to program and edit multiple objects at the same time. But this isn't the only way that parenting makes programming easier. If we have a collision event in another object with obj box, it will now include all the different kinds of boxes. However, a collision with a specific type of box will work in exactly the same way as before. We're going to use parenting in multiple situations in this tutorial, so hopefully you'll start to get an appreciation of how powerful it can be. Agent 8's behaviour in this game is a lot more complex than in the previous two examples. So much so that we're going to use multiple objects to represent Agent 8's behaviour in different states. Programmers often refer to this approach as a state machine. Agent 8 will begin in the standing state, as it will handle most of the transitions into the other states. A key press event, for example, will take Agent 8 into the hopping state, but it'll quickly return back again at the end of the animation. A similar setup will also work for the climbing state when jumping on top of a box. The falling state will be triggered when Agent 8 is no longer standing on something solid, and it will return back again when he is. We'll also make it possible to fall mid-hop, as this creates a smoother looking fall animation. Finally, we'll create a dead state for when he's crushed by a falling box, and there's no way of returning from that state. So that gives you all the background knowledge you'll need to make the game for yourself. As with the previous tutorials, the link in the video description will allow you to download all of the game's resources and a set of worksheets explaining how to make the game from scratch. Come back to this video when you're complete and we'll show you how to add some final bits of polish to your game. Welcome back. Hopefully you're now starting to see the power of using parenting in your game maker projects. To finish off, we're going to show you how to add a level progression to your game without manually creating lots of different rooms. We do this by creating a controller object, which handles the startup and reset of our room. In its game start event, we're setting a global variable called global.level to zero. As a global variable, this is now accessible from any object, but we're going to stick to using it in the controller object for now. We're then adding a room start event, which gets called every time the player completes the level. We're assuming here that the game quits or goes to a different room when the player dies. This event does most of the work, increasing the global level variable and using it to calculate the appropriate height for the pit. Note that this limits the height to a maximum of four boxes to stop the pit getting too deep to fit the room. The next bit of code loops round creating the appropriate number of instances of the pole object. If you're wondering how to work out the coordinates, then you can get this information from the room editor by dragging an instance into the room. Returning to the controller object, we just need to finish off the tops of the poles to create our dynamically sized pit. The final steps here move the controller object to the middle of the screen, ready to display the round number. 
they then set an alarm for removing it again. Here we can see the draw event's actions for displaying the round number, and the alarm event's actions to turn on gravity and make it fall off the screen again. And that's it. We now have a pit which gets deeper with each round, and you could use the same global level variable to make the game faster as it progresses too. Just don't forget to put an instance of that controller object in your room before you start. So that's it from us and our game development tutorials for beginners. We hope you've had fun making these games and that it inspires you to create bigger and better projects of your own. If you create something exciting, then we'd love to hear about it, so feel free to drop us an email or send us a tweet to let us know. Have fun!